Hi, just a little heads up that some of the content in Girls in Love by Jacqueline Wilson is for slightly older children. Thank you. Hi and welcome to part three of Girls in Love by Jacqueline Wilson, continuing from six letters. Dear Dan, I went to a great party on Saturday night, a real rave up. I danced, I drank, I socialised, I didn't get home till dawn. Dear Dan, I am a liar. You should see my tongue. We always, you always used to say when we were little that you got black spots on your tongue if you told a lie. Mine is black as coal all over it. It was truly a terrible party if you really want to know. So mind-bogglingly awful that I phoned my dad to come and get me early. I felt so stupid. There are all these long fussing articles in the papers about the teenagers of today and how they're all into drink and drugs and snogging everything in sight. Well, I am leading the most dull, dreary, demure life imaginable and it's dead boring. I feel sort of out of things, like I don't belong anywhere. Do you ever get that feeling? Of course you don't. You're a boy. You obviously don't know what it's like. You don't ever have to worry about how you look and what you wear and whether you're popular. I don't know why I'm writing all this rubbish. It's just it's late at night and I can't sleep and I'm feeling so fed up and there's no one I can really talk to. So hard luck, Dan. I'm rabbiting on to you. I've always had my two best friends, Magda and Nadine, to talk to, but it's sort of different now. I'm still friends with Magda, but she's such a jokey, lively, fun sort of girl. She doesn't always understand if I'm feeling depressed. And she's got this boyfriend, Greg, who she's seeing quite a lot of. She's not that keen on him, but he's okay. They were at this awful party, but it was all right for them because they could just sit in a corner by themselves and snog. Magda initiated the embrace. She just pounced and Greg was powerless, but he didn't seem to mind. Well, he wouldn't. Magda is a pretty stunning girl. Usually, if I'm feeling low, I confide in my other friend, Nadine, who is a naturally gloomy sort of girl. Nadine and I have been best friends ever since we were tiny tots. We even used to dress alike and pretend we were twins, which was a little dopey as I've always been small and round with frizzy hair and Nadine is tall and thin with dead straight hair, but we never let that deter us. But now she's got this boyfriend Liam and he's much older and Nadine thinks he's so cool and yet I think he's a creep because of the way he treats her, expecting her to do all sorts of stuff. Well, you know, and Nadine told me all this and I, I told Magda and Magda told Nadine she was an idiot and Nadine stopped talking to us and she still won't make it up and I'm dead worried about her. And I'm worried about my dad and my stepmother because right this minute they're having an argument in their bedroom. I can hear them, even though they're whispering. I don't know why they're having all these rows. They used to get on so well together. In fact, when Anna first came to live with us, I used to hope they would fight. I used to do my best to wind Anna up and kept telling tales on her to dad. Not because I absolutely hated her. In fact, she's okay, really. Well, most of the time. But she's my stepmother and I never wanted any kind of substitute mum because mine was the best in the world. I'm not going to write about my mum because it might make me cry. Anyway, I've sort of got used to Anna now. It's like we're friends. Not great friends, just okay, ordinary friends. She's always been so calm and quiet and happy, which is just as well because I can get ever so stroppy and moody sometimes. I'm a little brother. Oh, eggs is a right pain most of the time, as you know only too well. And my dad is the worst of us all for going ballistic, but Anna's always known how to handle him. She's always calmed him down. It's always been like he's this great growly dog and she knows just the way to give him a firm word and then a pat so he drools all over her like a puppy. But she's just lost the trick now. Or maybe she's got fed up with playing that game, I don't know. She seems to want to be her own person more, especially now Eggs has started school. She's tried to get back into doing design work, only there aren't any jobs going at the moment, which is a bit depressing for her. And then she started this evening class. And last Tuesday, there was a great ding-dong because I was going round to Magda's and Dad had promised to be home to look after eggs so Anna could go to the class, only something cropped up at my Dad's college and he didn't get back in time. And Anna couldn't go to her class and when I got back, I could see Anna had been crying. I can't see why going to this evening class should matter so much to her. It's Italian conversation and we're never ever going to go to Italy. Just boring old wet whales. Do you really like it? Mind you, I'd give anything to go to Italy because I want to see all the art. And Magda says the ice creams are mega fantastic. And Italian guys are meant to be the sexiest guys in the world. I suppose Anna likes art because she did go to art school. But she won't touch ice creams. She's far too fussed about keeping her figure. And Anna isn't into sexy Italian, Italian guys because she's got dad. Unless... Oh God. I've, uh, I've suddenly thought of something. Maybe... Maybe Anna's got another bloke, a sexy Italian, or is she just using the evening class as an excuse? And she's off meeting some mystery boyfriend somewhere. I've always wondered what on earth she sees in my dad as he's so much older than her and she's pretty stunning to look at. And dad's got this pot belly, though he sucks in his stomach whenever he looks in the mirror and insists all his flab is solid muscle and he wears jeans and denim jackets like he's young, only he isn't. 
And then there's his awful beard and his long hair and those terrible sandals he wears in the summer. And it's not as if he's got the easiest personality. I'll say, Dad just got, got up to go to the bathroom and he spotted my light on and he said, what on earth are you up to, Ellie? And he switched my light off. So I expect writings going up and down all over the place and you won't be able to read a thing. But anyway, it doesn't really matter because I don't think I'll be sending you this letter anyway as it's just a load of rambling rubbish and you'll think I've gone completely nuts. Love, Ellie. Dear Ellie, you're not nuts at all. I'm so glad you sent your letter. It was the best letter I've ever had. Well, <laughs> it was the best letter I've ever had. It was as if I've seen through a little window right into your head. I've read it over and over. I carry it about with me, well hidden, naturally. I was just so amazed and bowled over to realise you can get so bothered and fed up and stuff. Me too, me too, me too. You were entirely wrong about boys not knowing what it's like, though. I don't ever feel like I belong anywhere. I feel as if, as if I've been zapped here from my own special planet, Dan, and now I'm plodding around totally alien territory and all the earthlings are laughing at me, absolutely wetting themselves, and even more now because I'm reacting to alien air by erupting into loaves and pimples all over the place. Yuck, yuck, yuck. And even though I anoint my spots with all the sorts of junk mum buys in boots, it doesn't help much. My entire body seems to be going berserk. I'm not going into details, but girls have no idea at all how embarrassing it can be. I wish I could hide inside a special spaceman suit with a fishbowl helmet and not have to make contact with anyone else ever. Except you. You wrote Love Ellie for the first time. That's the best bit of your letter. I've read those two tiny words over and over so many times. It's a wonder the ink hasn't worn right off the page. Such is the ardour of my laser gaze. Lots of love, Dan. Dear Dan, I didn't mean to post that last letter. I just shoved it in an envelope in a tearing rush in the morning and put it in the letterbox as I ran for school. And then I remembered some of the stuff I'd said and I was so embarrassed. I even ran back to the letterbox and tried to wriggle my hand through the slot. Then this police panda car slowed down and I thought, oh my, oh my God, I'm going to get arrested for attempting to steal the Royal Mail. I wriggled my wrist free and sort of grinned sheepishly at these police guys and they just laughed at me. Most people laugh at me. I like the idea of wearing a space suit. I'd like one too. Only how can one communicate in a fishbowl helmet? You couldn't go shopping unless you did some serious miming to show you wanted the latest indie album, leaping in the air in manic mode. Come to think of it, you wouldn't be able to hear it. And what about talking to your friends? Though one of my best friends still isn't talking to me. And school? Though I'm not a brain box like you obviously are, so I don't do much communicating with the teachers at the best of times. This is the worst of times. I feel seriously fed up. Oh God, I'd better stop now or write another long rambly rubbishy letter. I don't really put love Ellie at the I didn't really put love Ellie last time, did I? I don't remember. I don't ever put love to anyone. Not even love or love. I just put me, Ellie. Dear Ellie, you did so put love Ellie. I have your letter here beneath my heart. Well, that sounds poetic, but it's not anatomically accurate. I don't have any pockets up at chest level. I've got your letter in my trouser pocket, so your words of love, not love, not love, love, are actually rubbing against my thigh. Only that sounds embarrassingly intimate, and I, I don't want this letter to develop into one of those porny pervy jobs some of the guys at my school write to girls. No, their letters are probably not to girls, they're just about girls. I don't want to think of you like that, Ellie. Not that you aren't absolutely wonderfully attractive, etc, etc, etc. It was love at first sight, like I said. I knew you were the girl for me. I think about you all the time. I've never been in love before. I suppose I love my mum and dad, though they do go on a bit and act all silent and reproachful if I want to do anything normal like watch Red Dwarf or Bottom or play computer games or go to a football match because they just want to read books and listen to classical music and wear Oxfam and recycle everything and lead a life as green as grass they think they think I should too. I love my brothers and sisters a bit too, though like your brother Eggs, they are ripe pains. No, excruciating agonies, especially when they come barging into my room and read all my private stuff and mock my new hairstyle. I'm trying to turn myself into a dead cool guy, so you will look at me and decide you'll follow me. Your lord, throughout the world, haven't suddenly gone nuts. Well, nuttier than I am already. It's something Juliet says. Are you doing Romeo and Juliet too? It's quite good though, it's murder doing it at my school because we're all boys, so some poor sap has to be Juliet when we read aloud. I was the original poor sap, actually. Everyone fell about and I could see this was not going to improve my street cred among the lads, so I had to camp it up and do Juliet in a silly high-pitched girly voice, which got me into trouble with the teacher. Shame, as he's quite a decent bloke, really, and he's lent me some of his books. But it made everyone think I'm, not in in I'm a nut instead of a nerd. 
Only I don't want to be. And there's nothing I can do about my weedy physique or lousy complexion. And I can't even earn any hard cash for a cool clothes till I'm 14. But I did think a haircut might help. Mum normally just chops bits off here and there. Not a pretty sight. So I badgered her to let me go to a proper barber. And I said I wanted a radical new hairstyle. One that would last. Until I see you. When will that be? Can you come and stay for the weekend any time? But our house is ever so crowded with the kids stuff. All the flannels in our bathroom are currently growing mustard and cress and you can't eat off the table in the living room because it's covered with a giant jigsaw puzzle and there are ducks swimming in the bath. Generally just the plastic variety, but you never know. And if you sleep in the only spare bed, that means my sisters, Rianne and Lara, will be in the bunk bed opposite and Rianne sings all the time, even when she's asleep. And Lara climbs into the bed with you at four in the morning, bringing her entire soft toy menagerie with her. So you'll be ever so, ever so welcome, but not extremely comfortable. So how about it if I stay with you? I have this cousin who is going out with a girl at London University, so he drives down most Friday nights and says he doesn't mind me giving giving me a lift, which is brilliant. So what about next weekend? Although maybe I ought to wear a space helmet for real, made of black ambulance glass, because the new haircut might just be a bit of a mistake. My mum shook her head and sighed deeply when she saw me. My dad got all worried that I joined some skinhead gang. My brothers and sisters fell about laughing, which was nothing compared to the reaction of the guys at school. I'm certainly well established as a nut now. You will also get a right laugh when you see me, Ellie. So next week, yes? I'll be arriving between eight and nine, depending on traffic. See you soon. Lots and lots and lots of love. Dan. Dear Dan. No, don't come next weekend. I'm sorry, but it's Magda's birthday and we're hanging out there Saturday. And then, well, we'll be going out celebrating somewhere, but it's, it's girls only, I'm afraid. So I can't ask you to come. In actual fact, I don't really think it would be a good idea if you came at all, because our spare bed situation is pretty chronic too. Eggs broke the springs on the guest bed, so it's just a camp bed, the sort that suddenly springs shut when you're inside it. So let's wait until we meet up again in Wales, right? Do you go there at Christmas? We do. It's completely crackers. We all have to wear six jumpers, and it snows, and there's frost inside the windows, let alone outside, but it's becoming a loopy family tradition. Worst luck. Still, if you're there, st- there too, uh, we could play S- Sir Edmund, Hillary and Sherpa Tensing. L. Ellie. Dear Ellie, I can't wait till Christmas. I'll come the next weekend after the next weekend. Lots and lots and lots and lots of love. Dan. Seventh Heaven. Of course Dan can come and stay the weekend after next, says Anna. Oh, eggs, what's your juice is spilling it all? No. You weren't listening, I say. I don't want him to come. I thought you just said you did, says Anna, stripping Egg stark naked and stuffing his pyjamas straight into the washing machine. I'm all bare. Look at my willy, Ellie, says Eggs, practically waving it at me. Yuck, can't you stuff him in the washing machine too, Anna, I say. She's on her knees, sorting through the dirty clothes basket, juggling little balls of socks. You just wish you had a willy too, says Eggs. boy, Eggs, says Dad, finishing his coffee. You've got these women sussed out. Right, I'm off. Why are you going so early, says Anna. Can't you wait and take eggs to school? No, there's someone I've got to catch, says Dad, scooping up eggs with one arm and giving him a kiss. Who, says Anna, her fists clenching. Oh, for God's sake, Jim Dean, the graphics guy, Anna, don't start. It's not me that starts things, it's you, says Anna. Okay, okay, you go to work. Just make sure you come home on time. I'm not going to miss my Italian class again. You in that wretched evening class, you go on about it as if it's the most important thing in your life says Dad, as Eggs wriggles free. What else have I got in my life? Anna says bitterly. She holds out an armful of smelly socks. My life is so full and so rich and so exciting. Here I am sorting your dirty socks. Wow, I can barely contain my excitement. Why can't you smooth them out straight for a start? Why should I have to unravel them all? Why can't you put them in the machine? You keep kidding yourself you're still a young man. So why don't you act like a new man and do your share of the chores? Why can't you act like a young woman You are instead of a bitter old nag, says Dad, and he walks out. Anna bursts into tears as the front door slams. Mum, says Eggs, have you hurt yourself? Get washed, Eggs. Put your clothes on, I say, steering him towards the door. Mummy do it, says Eggs. Don't be such a baby. Mum's tired. Now off you go. I'll take you to school. I don't want you to take me to school. Dad takes me. Listen, Squirt, you wash, you get dressed, you do as I say, and then I might tell you the egg story on the way to school. Oh, wow, right, okay, says Eggs, whizzing off. He pauses at the door. Mum, isn't it getting better? Yes, um, 
I'm fine now, says Anna, sniffing. Go on, go and get washed. Lickety, lickety spit. Eggs rushed off, mumbling, lick and spit, lick and spit, lick and spit. Thanks, Ellie, says Anna. Anna, you and Dad. Oh, it's, it's just a bad patch. Anna, I still, I stand still in the quiet kitchen. Anna, there isn't anyone else, is there? Anna's head jerks. Someone else, she says. She's staring at me, her face very white. Why? What makes you say that? What, what do you know? Ellie? I don't know anything. I just wondered. Well, Dad can be a right pain at times, and if you've met someone else at your Italian class, well, it's scary because it's horrid with you and Dad arguing like this. But I do understand. I know I always used to take Dad's side, but now I'm older. Well, I wouldn't blame you if you had an affair, Anna. Anna is staring, as if she can hardly believe what I'm saying. Then she shakes her head, half laughing, though she's still got tears in her eyes. I'm not having an affair, you chump, she says. Then, I suddenly realise, is Dad? I don't know. He says he isn't. I say he is. Sometimes I think he's telling the truth and I'm just paranoid. Other times I'm sure he's lying, says Anna, hurling the socks into the machine, along with all his other stuff. Who do you think it is? Some girl in his art class. I don't know her name, but I saw her hanging on his arm in the town. Very young, very pretty, with a lot of blonde hair. Well, couldn't they just be walking along together? Maybe. But I saw the way he was looking at her, the way he used to look at me. Oh, Anna. I hover helplessly. I'm sorry, says Anna, shutting the door of the washing machine and getting to her feet. I shouldn't have said anything. It's probably all my imagination anyway. It's just when I, I get started, I can't stop. It's just, I love him so. That's the weirdest bit. I think about it as I take eggs to school. I'm busy making up this daft cereal story he likes about the extremely Ovid Eggles. There's Mama Eggle, Papa Eggle, Grandma and Grampy Eggle, and hundreds of eggy little Eggles. Edward, Edwina, Edith, Enid, Ethelred, Ethan, Evangeline, and they all sleep in an Eggedorm, which has a big bed with oval segments for the Eggles to snug in, and then when they get up in the morning, they wobble to a hole in the floor and whiz down this slide to get to their breakfast in the kitchen down below. They only ever eat cornflakes, they hate and detest cooked breakfast, and then there are their cousins, the Chockies, who only visit at Easter and they hate hot weather. I go on and on and it gets sillier and sillier, but Eggs adores it. After a while, my mouth takes over and tells the story while my mind thinks about Anna and Dad. How can she still love him like that? I suppose I love him, but he's my dad. I couldn't stick him as my partner, especially if he started playing around. Anna must have got it wrong. Why on earth would any pretty young student fall for my dad? And yet Anna did exactly that. I can't understand it. Dad isn't even good looking as old guys go. Why don't they want someone young and gorgeous like... Oh God, it's him. My Dan, the dream one with the blonde hair and the brown eyes. I haven't seen him for ages. I gave up on him and started getting the bus every day, but now he's walking towards me, getting nearer. I think he's looking at me. He is. Oh, what shall I do? I look away. Oh, please don't let me blush. I'm getting hot. He's getting nearer still. Ellie, Ellie, what's up? Go on with the Eggle story, Eggs demands, tugging at my arm as if it's a water pump. In a minute, I mutter. Now, Eggs demands, you promised. He's right in front of me. I look up and he's smiling. He's really smiling. Then he shakes his head at eggs. Little brothers, he says to me. I nod, dumbstruck. See you, he says, and he walks on. See you, I whisper, dazed. Ellie, who's that man, eggs demands. Shh, I hiss. I don't know. Why have you gone red? Oh God, have I? Ever so. Go on with the Eggle story, please. I blurt out a few dumb Eggle incidents, involving, inventing... A new egg who is made of solid gold, so gleaming yellow that he dazzles everyone. I deliver eggs to his primary school and dawdle off in the general direction of my school. I'm going to be late, of course, but I can't possibly dash. I need to save at this moment. He said, see you. He really did. I didn't make him up. He was there. He spoke to me and he said, see you, which means see you again, or even I want to see you again. Oh, I want to see you again so much. All my problems with the insistence of the real Dan seem unimportant. I can't even worry too much about Dad and Anna now. This is one of the most magical moments of my life. I feel like Juliet. I wish I dared bunk off school and drift around all day hanging on to his, this feeling. But I trudge there eventually and get seriously told off for my pains. Nadine is still being all cold and huffy. And when we do PE, we see another love bite. Lower down this time. Magda and I can't help boggling at it as Nadine hurriedly pulls on her game shirt. What are you staring at, she says. Nadine? Isn't it flipping obvious, says Magda. 
Can't you get Liam to eat a decent meal before he goes out with you? He seems to want to slurp great goblets out of you all the time. Just mind your own business, okay? Says Nadine. Magda shrugs and saunters out of the changing rooms. I hang back. Nadine knows I'm still here, but she bends down, fussing with her shoes. Her hair swings forward and I see the startlingly, startlingly white scalp at her parting. I remember when we used to play hairdressers and how I loved to brush Nadine's long, soft, rustling hair. So different from my own mass of wire wool. Naddy baddy, I say softly. I haven't called her that since we were in the infants. She looks up and she's suddenly herself again. Ellie Smelly, she says. Oh, Nad, make friends, eh? I did never break friends. Yes, but you've been all cold and narky. Well, you started it, gabbing to Magda. I know, I'm sorry. I could have bitten my tongue off for telling her. Look, I stick my tongue out and mine biting it. I'm a little too enthusiastic in my demonstration and my teeth sink in before I can stop them. Ouch! Oh, Ellie, you are a nutcase. Nadine gives me a quick hug. We're friends, okay? I'm so glad. I can't stand not being friends with you, I say, sucking my tongue. Are you going to be friends with Magda too? Well, only if she stops giving me grief about Liam. She's just jealous anyway, because he's so dishy, a hundred times better than that Greg of hers. Cheek, says Magda, who's come running back to see what's happened to me. Then she laughs, but certainly partly true. Greg isn't a patch on Liam when it comes to looks. When I first saw your Liam, I was dead jealous. I admit it. But now, oh Nadine, can't you see? He's just using you. No, he's not. He really cares about me. He can barely leave me alone when we're together, Nadine says. Yes, but... That's just sex, Nadine. That's all he wants. He doesn't even take you out properly, just gets you to go off on all these walks. He does so take me out. We're going to Seventh Heaven on Saturday night, says Nadine. He's got these freebie tickets from a mate. Wow, Seventh Heaven, I say. It's the newest and baddest and best club. Everyone's desperate to go there. None of our lot has made it yet. But what about my birthday, says Magda? I thought you guys were coming round to my place, right? And we would go out, all girls together. Oh, God, says Nadine. I forgot, Magda. And these tickets, they're just for Saturday night. What am I going to do? It's okay, says Magda. You go. Who'd want to pass up a chance to go to Seventh Heaven? Hey, Ellie, how about if you and me go too? I'll get my dad to cough up the cash. Don't worry, Nadine. We won't cramp your style. We'll keep well away from you and Dracula. Dracula, indeed, says Nadine. But she laughs. It's okay at last. We're all three friends again, and we're going to Seventh Heaven. I wonder if the blonde dreamboat Dan ever goes clubbing. Nadine is telling her parents she's spending Saturday with Magda. I really am, but of course I'm not telling Dad and Anna we're planning to go to Seventh Heaven. My dad loves to act laid back, but I know he'd never let me go there in a million years because there's been all this stuff in the local papers for weeks about the fights at four in the morning and girls being rushed to hospital with drug overdoses and all this other seriously heavy stuff. I just tell them Magda's having this little party and I'll sleep over at her place and come home sometime on Sunday. What are you going to wear to this party, Dad says. Not that t-shirty thing again. He's home half an hour early, so Anna's all set for her evening class. Dad's trying to act as if the row this morning didn't happen. Maybe it's time you had some new clothes, Ellie. Ellie, Ellie, here. He stands me, hands me 20 quid, then realises it's not enough. He fumbles in his wallet. Haven't got enough cash. Look, why don't you go shopping with Anna? Use the credit card. He looks at Anna. Both of you buy yourself something new, eh? Anna looks tense. I'm scared she's going to start another row, start on about guilt money or something, and then I won't get my outfit after all. But then she shrugs. Okay, sure. So, Ellie, we'll go late night shopping tomorrow. Can you get home early again and look after eggs, Dad? I say. He's such a pain to take shopping. There, I fix Dad now. He can't stay out late and play around. Anna gives me a little nod of acknowledgement. It turns out that we have fun shopping together. It's almost as if Anna is Magda or Nadine. We wander around Jigsaw and Warehouse and River Island and Miss Selfridge. And Anna tries on all this mad stuff. And when I see her slinking around the changing room, showing off her navel in this really raunchy gear, I just fall about laughing. And she gets the giggles too. And it's like we're two girls together. I dare squeeze into some of the sexier stuff too, but it's a big mistake. I am the mistake. I am big. Well, F-A-T. You're not fat, Ellie. For God's sake, you're just perfectly normal size, Anna insists. Although she's Miss Stick Insect herself, as she, so she's okay. I'm Miss Big Bumblebee, with the emphasis on the bum. What am I going to wear, I say, after I've tried on 101 outfits and discarded them all? I want something hip and cool and now, and yet I look positively indecent in all this stuff. 
You're just a bit curvy for current fashion, said Anna. You don't want these tacky tops or skimpy little skirts. So what else am I going to wear? A black plastic rubbish bag? We'll find you the perfect outfit, Ellie. I promise, says Anna. And she does. There's this long, tight, stretchy skirt that I'm scared might be a bit frumpy, but there's a sexy slit up the back. And then she finds a satin shirt to go over the top. I try it on and it's like, wow, I'm not me anymore. I don't look like some stupid, podgy little kid. I look much older, 15, maybe even 16. Oh, Anna, it's great, I say, but the two together are going to be ever so pricey. So what, says Anna? Let's go mad. She buys a little short, bright skirt for herself that is so different from her usual check shirt and jeans young mum style. Anna doesn't look older. She looks much, much younger. Let's buy some tarty shoes too, she says. We strut around in these silly heels, both of us staggering. Then we go for identical black suede shoes with little buckles. You have them, Ellie. It's okay, says Anna. No, it's not fair. You saw them first. You have them, Anna. You two are very sweet to each other for sisters, says the assistant, laughing at us. We're not sisters, says Anna, though it feels like we are sometimes. We're friends, I says. And it's true. For the moment, anyway. We both get a pair of black buckled shoes and we dance down the road in them, though we've both got blisters by the time we get home. Anna's being so sweet, I feel bad about telling her lies. But I know the moment I mentioned Seventh Heaven, she'd morph into strict stepmother mode and say no way. So off I go to Magda's on Saturday and we have a fun time with her family. You should see the birthday presents they gave her. It's not as if they're rolling in money either. She gets a VCR for her bedroom and a satin blouse, a bit like mine but much more clingy, and a huge cuddly bunny and a lacy nighty and a big box of chocks and a posh lipstick and nail varnish, lots of CDs and scent and a necklace and a great big basket of smelly stuff. The Dean sends her a Forever Friends card to show she really wants to make up with a pair of ultra sexy black knickers inside. I give Magda a cartoon card I drew myself with Magda up on a pedestal being worshipped by all these different males. Not just Greg and his mates and poor sappy Adam, but people like Mr Lanes, the history teacher, who is quite dishy in a mature sort of way. And I add all her favourite film stars and rock stars too. It sounds like showing off, but she really loves that card and my present too. That's homemade as well. Anna helped me make it last night. Magda's always liked the cookie monster in Sesame Street, so I baked her a whole batch of different cookies, chocolate and raisin and cherry, and then, when they were cool, I put them in a special tin. It's airtight, so the cookies can keep. But as we spend most of Saturday afternoon in Magda's room, mucking around and watching videos, we keep stuffing cookies one after the other, so there aren't many actually left now. It's a good job my new skirt has an elasticated waistband, because Magda's mum gets together this incredible birthday cake, and creme brulee, and tiramisu, and bonoffi pie, and all the poached salmon and quiche and chicken, and little sausage on stick stuff. We better watch what we drink at Seventh Heaven, or there's going to be a serious chucking up situation, Magda whispers. I'm starting to feel a bit sick, actually, when we set out. Not because of all the food, because suddenly Seventh Heaven is the very last place I want to go. You have to queue up to get in, and this awful bouncer guy at the door eyes you up and down, and th if he thinks you're too young or too wet or too boring, he won't let you in. I don't want to go, but it would still be terrible to be turned away. Come on, Ellie, what are you hanging back for, Magda asks. My shoes hurt, I say, which is true, and the slits on my skirt isn't that big, so my knees are a bit hobbled. Magda, what if we don't get in? We will. You leave it to me, says Magda. We don't know anyone that goes there, so we'll be part of the great new crowd, says Magda, and anyway, we know Nadine, don't we? It's seriously weird when we get there and join the queue. There are some very tall, glam girls with very tarty clothes, lots of makeup, who make me feel very small and mousy. Clock all those drag queens, says Magda, giving me a nudge. I blink and take another look. Magda's right. They're boys under all the blusher. And there are other gay guys too, in tight t-shirts and fantastic tight leather trousers, showing off their muscle tone. There are girls too, giggling together, with cropped hair and nose studs. I think it's a gay night, I hiss. Oh Magda, maybe we're going to look stupid if we try to get in tonight. Relax babe, it's everybody's night, says Magda, nodding at a crowd of guys further up the queue. Wow, they look pretty tasty. Now they're not gay, I'm sure of it. And look, there are loads of straight couples too. Can you see Nadine and Dracula? I can't see them at all. I just see lots and lots of cool, clubby, chic people, and I feel smaller and sadder every second. We're working our way up the queue now, and I'm so scared the guy will tell you, you must be joking, you don't belong here, you silly little schoolgirl, and then I'll literally shrivel up in my suede shoes and die here and now. But Magda winks at him saucily, and he grins at her and nods us both in. Just like that. I can't believe it. 
It's so great, seeing inside Seventh Heaven. It's midnight blue with luminous stars and incredible strobes, and the music is so loud and the smoky cloud stuff pumping all over the place. It's so strange that I stopped being me, Ellie. I'm this new cool clubber, and I'm here to have fun. Magda and I have a quick tour around to see if we can spot Nadine, but she's not here, not yet. Magda takes me by the wrist and we get onto the dance floor. I'm not too bad at dancing, but I generally worry in case anyone's looking at me and noticing my fat bum, but now I just get into the rhythm and I leap around like part of the crowd. I am the crowd. We're all the crowd and it's truly fantastic. Only we get tired eventually and go to get a drink. Magda orders two vodka and cranberry juices at the bar, but the barman tells her to dream on, so we have the juice without the vodka. It's more refreshing that way. Then this older guy comes up and starts hitting on Magda, leaning over and whispering in her ear. My heart starts hammering, because what am I going to do if she gets off with someone? But then Magda shakes her head and he goes away. What was he saying, I ask? Oh, he was pushing E and Wiz and all that junk, says Magda. Really, I say, staring after this real life drug pusher. It's okay, I made it plain we're not into drugs. There are lots of other kids who obviously are. As it gets later, lots start crashing about, their eyes huge and staring. A girl near us suddenly sits on the floor and starts weeping. I stare at her, wondering if she's all right. Suddenly, Seventh Heaven doesn't seem quite such a glittery place after all. I still can't see Nadine anywhere. Maybe she isn't going to turn up. Magda and I dance again, and I have to take my shoes off. But I don't dare put them down in case they get kicked away, so I dangle them by their straps, which is a bit awkward. I'm starting to get ever so tired. I think Magda is too. Then, way off at the other side of the club, right at the back, I think I see the blonde head. My dream guy. Well, maybe not. I can't see properly. Heaps of guys have their that amazing fair hair, so I think it really could be him. Only now there's a whole load of other kids in front of him. Let's go over the other side for a bit, I suggest, trying to sound dead casual, though I have to yell in Magda's ear before she can hear me above the music. We're edging our way over when we spot Nadine at last. She's dancing wildly, her dark hair flying, her eyes very big, very black, very staring. What the hell is she on? says Magda. Liam is with her. It's horrible the way he's leering at her. Hey, Nadine! Magda yells, charging over to her. You look ever so hot. I think you maybe need a drink. Come to the ladies' room, eh? Liam tells Magda to get lost. Magda takes no notice. Nadine, come on! Magda takes hold of one arm. I take the other and we pull her away. I glance back once but I can't see any blonde head now. Maybe I was mistaken anyway. Nadine is all sweaty and stares at us blearily, practically out of it. What has that pig got you to take, eh? Magda says fiercely. You'd better have a drink of water. Several. You're dehydrated. Only not too much, she says, as Nadine bends over the wash basin and the ladies and starts slurping straight from the tap. Honestly, you're like a baby. It's a good job Ellie and I are here to keep an eye on you. Magda finds a paper cup and we give Nadine a couple of drinks. Then she staggers off to the loo. A whole little gang of girls come into the ladies. It's okay, we're not in the queue, we're just waiting for our friend, Magda tells them. She's not the dark-haired girl with that Liam, is she? Says one of the girls. So, says Magda. Well, she wants to keep clear of him. He used to hang around this girl at our school, really young, just in year eight, or maybe she just started year nine. Magda and I keep stum. He has this thing about really young girls. He says, if you go with virgins, you don't have to bother about safe sex because you can't catch anything off them. What? I say. I don't believe it, says Magda. It's true. He's done it with lots of girls, but he gives them the elbow a minute, the minute they start to cut, put out. This girl at our school, she got pregnant from this one, one time, but he just told her to get lost. He didn't want to know. He said she was a slag anyway, saying if she'd do it with him, then she'd do it with anyone. Magda and I stare at each other, horrified. Then we look at the cubicle where Nadine is. Surely she must have heard. She stays in there until all the other girls have gone. After a few minutes, we hear her crying. Come out, Naddy, I whisper. Yes, come on, babe, it's just us, says Magda. Nadine comes out, tears streaming down her face. She heard all right. We're going to go home, says Magda, putting her arm around her. We'll sneak out the back, leave him standing there. I've got the cab fare. You come back to my place and sleep over with Ellie and me. So that's just what we do. And when I wake up at dawn and hear Nadine sobbing in the spare bed, I slip over and get in beside her and cuddle her close. And that is where we will leave part three of Girls in Love by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this story and loads of other stories and videos coming your way on my channel very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.